Thanks, John. Thanks for calling us. Um, hello, everyone. Um, as, as John said, this is a, a, a two-header. Two um, I'm going to set the scene, really, for the, the excavation work that we've undertaken recently at Camp Allen, and um, Gordon will describe the results in some detail. I'd just like to very quickly um, congratulate the conference organisers on doing a grand job today. Um, very interesting range of papers, all sorts of uh, interesting work going on across the region, and well done to you all as well for, for coming out and, and turning up and supporting the conference. Is this Hopefully, hopefully you can still hear me there. Um, right, Dunthalen Castle, for uh, many of you will know it, I'm sure. For those of you who don't, it's um, it's absolutely fabulous castle. It's one of the, the, the last great curtain wall castles built in Scotland. Um, dates from around about 1360, when William, the first Earl of Douglas, built um, the great, oops, built the great curtain wall across the promontory. Um, so it's a curtain wall with three um, towers projecting from it, the, um, the mid tower being the gatehouse, the constable's lodgings, the, the Douglas Tower itself, the main, the, the Lord and Lady's residence, and um, another tower at the south end of the site for presumably for guests. This one would have been extremely large, um, the Douglas Tower, probably 30 metres high in its day, 100 feet, that's really the equivalent of a, a modern block of flats in height. It has a um, very good surviving two-story hall range in the inner close. That's very unusual for the hall range to survive right next to the residential accommodation there. And that's one of the main items of significance of Uptown Tower. You'll notice it's very close to the cliff edge, rather like I know we were hearing about earlier. Um, some of the structure has been lost over the cliffs in the, in the centuries in between. Um, so it has an inner close, uh, a very large outer close here, where we would expect to see service structures in the medieval period, bake houses, workshops, stables, that kind of thing. And one solitary little 17th century duke, very nice duke there. Um, outer defences, lots of, uh, uh, of ditches going on, an extremely large rock cut ditch in front of the curtain wall. Here's the outer ditch. And then beyond this, also, uh, it has a, a ravelin feature, uh, a gun battery. Um, the same sort of function as the one time out of that. And, um, but notice how the areas are all very um, empty at the moment, empty looking. And we imagine these would have been bristling with activity in the medieval period. So one of the things we wanted to do was to put some flesh on the bones, if you like, of the archaeology that you can see, reveal some more about the buried archaeology. And um, we're going to do a major reinterpretation of Tantalan over the next couple of years. We wanted this to have a strong archaeological research element, though, so that we can feed in new results into the, the new interpretation. Um, that's another overview of the site. I won't, I won't dwell on that one too much. Um, but you can see what a large site it is. Very extensive, very well preserved, buried archaeology right across the site. It's been in Historic Scotland, or its predecessor guardianship, since 1924. Um, we think some clearance excavation was done in the 1920s. We wanted to, to look at that archaeologically as well and evaluate what sort of impact that might have had on the buried archaeology of the site. There's a view from the wall top, a spectacular site. Um, and of course, um, for a natural history interest, it's also very significant. It looks out over the Bass Rock, really large Gannett colonies, and some of you will be aware of. Um, it has a, a history which connects up with the history of the Bass Rock really well. Um, conservation is, is a big task at Tantalan. Um, the stonework is very soft, lovely quarried stonework. You can see how the wind beats it away. This is just a view from one of the windows. Um, and really quite a challenge. So we have been working hard on that over the years. And archaeology can feed into the conservation work quite successfully. Um, this is the four tower structure, which is right in front of the gatehouse and barbican, the medieval barbican. Four tower dates from the early 16th century when the site was being um, strengthened against the, the threat of artillery attack, it's just there. And the four tower was composed out of rather soft, again locally quarried, green um, basalt type stone from the local cliffs. But very, very soft, so it was very vulnerable to weathering. So we've consolidated it from top to bottom, 
When we got near the bottom, of course, we weren't very sure of the profile of the tower as it disappeared below the ground. So we've done quite a lot of um, archaeological recording. Um, Kirkdale Archaeology, who worked with us, has done a lot of really good work alongside the fort tower there, a couple of archaeological trenches, and a lot of really good photogrammetry and, and measured survey work. Um, we use a lot of this information in our reconstructions. So um, one of my jobs is to work with, with artists we will do reconstruction uh, drawings to try and bring it alive for visitors and we're working on a new series of these, about 17 new pieces of artwork uh, going in um, very shortly externally to the council and then we'll deal with the internal spaces. It's really quite a large reinterpretation project. As I mentioned, we wanted it to have a lot of archaeology in it, a lot of archaeology feeding into the stories. Um, the castle has been under siege. Um, not just by archaeologists, but by but three times during its history, uh, three major sieges, um, 1491, James IV brought, brought an army here, and also his ship um, blockaded it off the coast. 1528, um, his son, James V, also laid siege to the castle. Both these were rather unsuccessful sieges. Um, the James IV siege in, in documentary accounts talks rather a lot about him playing cards on the deck of his ship. doesn't actually mention the outcome of the siege, so imagine that uh, the castle survived rather well. But in 1650 to 51, um, Cromwell's army diverted from there, from their route north, to uh, deal with the contingent of moss troopers who were harassing their supply lines, and uh, they brought heavy artillery to bear on that island and um, caused quite a lot of damage, especially to the two end towers. Um, just to briefly talk about the Paducah, because it's lovely, it's got a, a thousand nesting boxes approximately inside here wonderful 17th century structure, but it is the only surviving upstanding structure in the outer close. And uh, along with Kirkdale Archaeology, we've been investigating the outer close in much more detail, and we're trying to put some more structures in there for our, our future artwork illustrations. Um, so we started off last year, in the spring of 2013, with a geophysics survey across the site by Rose Geophysics. Um, this produced absolutely wonderful results. Actually, they, they look rather pale there. But um, these are very good results. When you get your eye in, they, uh, they show lots of areas of compaction, um, what, look like, what looked like structures, um, rectangular structures in the enclosed there, but areas where there may have been floor surfaces or uh, a lot of stonework buried under the ground. So this is the, the geophysics, the resistivity survey. Um, this is the curtain wall, by the way, just to get your bearings. This is the outer ditch and the outer defences. Um, so uh, our trench is rather like microsurgery on the site, very small sample we, we excavated, but um, the trench is in red there, targeted the main anomalies of the geophysics survey, so that we could evaluate the geophysics and, uh, and learn more about the site in that way. But we wanted, we've gone very, very carefully on this, we don't want to remove very much of the archaeology pool, just to evaluate it and evaluate its potential for future study. So um, we were joined on site by um, the Friends of the North Berwick Museum. Thanks very much for, for their help. Any of you are here. And Edinburgh Field Archaeology Society, likewise, really enthusiastic volunteers. We tried to get as many volunteers involved in the project as we could. Um, we, we advertised the, the two phases of excavation um, as far as we could locally. Um, we weren't able to give people a lot of notice, and we'll try and address that in future so that people can join us. But we've had um, all sorts of really enthusiastic volunteer help, and we couldn't have done what we did without that volunteer help. So uh, well done, everybody who was involved. Um, along, as I mentioned, with Kirkdale Archaeology, who are really experienced in this kind of work, and a great pleasure to, to work with. Um, here's uh, Alan Ladley, in fact, works with Kirkdale, um, busy, busy on site. These, these guys know, know it all, back to front. I've, uh, I've been there and done it, and got the T-shirt. And um, although it wasn't T-shirt weather, I have to tell you. But um, really, that it's been an absolute pleasure working with Clydesdale. And we did a lot of um, public engagement. We had um, every day, really, was an open day. And um, I was very busy doing guided tours around the archaeology. We had the finds processing outside, um, all the sort of sampling work and so on, all going on. And people came along, asked questions, and really engaged very positively with the archaeology, which was tremendous to see. Not just locals, but people on holiday as well, tourists from really all over the world, from um, just quickly, um, a bit more public engagement, family uh, weekends we had. You can see we've been very, very careful with the spoil, uh, well-visited site, we're trying to do this very tidily. Youngsters as well, um, we had a family weekend, lots of kids getting involved, lots of kids traveling away, 
I didn't have to do too much work that day. They all just got involved and uh, traveled away. Very enthusiastic. They had reenactors on the site, these guys with, with the muskets um, firing off a volley of shots. Um, and if that wasn't loud enough, then they had they brought this, they wheeled this little gun on as well, which was absolutely terrifying, and uh, fired it towards the castle. But as you can see, just a fantastic thing. Um, 17th century reenactors um, recreating the time of the Cromwell and Sea. I'll just say quickly go through. And um, the Young Archaeologist Club, the East Lothian Group, and the Edinburgh branches got together and visited the site as well, and were engaged in all sorts of excavation survey processing processing activities and gave us a lot of help. And now I'll pass over to Gordon to uh, explain more of the archaeological results. Thanks very much. Stand by. <laughs> through these sort of far too many slides and too little time, but never mind. That, for those of you who are top gear sort of tendencies, is enough to be 35. This is my parents' board this in 1959, and I'm very much here today. And this enabled me to visit for the first time Tantana Castle. That was regarded as a day out in my 835 with Dad. And I bought the blue book. Do you remember these books? They took no prisoners. They cut no corners. This is a particularly fine example of the type. Whole screens of primary data, no translation offered, straight to the point. And a few ominous remarks about, as David Hank touched on, works in 1924 where the site was thoroughly gone over <laughs> and the item works were excavated to their original levels. So there you have it. So something pretty dramatic did happen all those years ago. I'll just throw this one in because again, I got the bug a little bit. It's school, it's the ground school that I went to, ground was very. We did a hole, and believe it or not, it was across an old artillery defence in the country. You know, nothing really changes. And, uh, the, you know, as I say myself, it's quite a good effort for 1963. And the same characteristics occur very much so at Tantalo. Turf banks, cut this, deep cutting, this sort of thing. Very turf line. And there we have it. Now, this, these shots were courtesy from friendly Americans who turned up the vintage aircraft and took a lot of shots for us. And as David pointed out, we were really trying to do a strategic sort of appraisal of the geophysical works, which had happened the year before. And in three weeks, we dug a series of trenches. Never mind. In the three basic areas of the castle the inner ward, the middle ward, or the outer ward, and the outer defences. And this is the uh, magnetometer survey. This doesn't really show a great deal, but the resistivity. Oh, wrong. Resistivity is a bit more interesting, and we just plonked the lines, as you do, across the edges of these features. Not terribly scientific, but effective. And it's one way of getting, as I say, a reasonable handle across the entire site, basing ourselves on what is obviously quite a comprehensive geophysical uh, you know, a plan. And to start with, this year we dug trenches at, where is the point of here? Which one is it? Yeah, All right. Oh, <laughs> there we go. Yes. So we dug a hole here, another one here, one out here, one out here. So we'll start with number five up here. This was actually a relic from the previous site, previous excavations, and we found basically the remains of a demolished structure. This demolished structure was stone of some quality, and it had been completely cleared away. It wasn't just some work from the twenties. This had been demolished in the later medieval period. The section doesn't show a great deal, but essentially we might say that the, let's see, the, um, the alignment of the walls suggests this structure came away from parallel. We thought the edge of the cliff, but in fact it wasn't. It's coming in the inner walls. Maybe one of the buildings that we were wondering about in terms of service structures and the rest. Any back finds, little bronze ring here, and more usefully, a piece of an architectural fragment, which I, I dare say is that makes the structure that was demolished maybe of some quality, rather than just being a service structure, there's something a little more sophisticated than that. The next trench was the one just here, just here, 
there. <laughs> and the idea behind that was that we direct the ops into gatehouse. Again, striking a kind of, you know, big, get the bigger picture. Is this the way in? Is this always been the way towards the castle? The gate tower, as I say, has some antiquity and complications. So we dug a hole, and lo and behold, we did find a series of um, surfaces, roadways, if you like. Now, this one, again, I'll be absolutely honest, shows some of the signs of the excavation that we got from the volunteers. In other words, we, oh, that it's a little bit overdone. And in fact, this thing sits up a little too proudly than it probably should. So in a sense, what we're looking at are two areas of hard standing, of, of, of a sort of, I don't know, some sort of payday, if you like, set against the hard standing. So the road itself wasn't just a narrow path we really, leading sort of a tenuous way towards the main entrance, but it was actually more of a formal roadway with perhaps trackway for the uh, uh, vehicles. The next trench was in the inner court, in the courtyard itself, again, a ward, early days. Moving on, and again, this was quite a indicative kind of, of what we found towards the north end of the courtyard. In other words, it was an industrial structure. We found one the previous year, and what you see here is the beginnings of. That's basically the natural clay cover of the headland, which was cut, as you see, the series of pits, function unknown at this point. But as we looked at the other end of the site, other end of the trench, you could see quite deep linear cuts, slots, or channels, all of which have been quite intense, um, far, uh, heat, heat affected. And on top of that, you can see again, this is quite um, indicative here are the pits cut against the natural clay. Here are these slots, and here again is some of, of the natural clay here. So something large and linear looking in the middle containing an awful lot of burnt debris, some of which were iron crucible fragments, sort of bone-shaped things. We got a four or five of those and an awful lot of the sale of heat affected stone. I suggest some sort of smelting and working is going on in this structure. Now we move across to the outer ward and we look at trenches 10 and 11, <coughs> which are here and here. Again, deliberately sort of placed across some rigged tunnel, or the shooting rigged tunnel, we'll check that out, and also to try and set some light on what appears to be a comprehensive artillery work lying outside the main defensive line defined by the, the big ditch. This is the digging going on, as we said, we need some effort to try and keep everything tidy and nice, much backfilling and turfing and the rest of it. And yeah, I mean, it's not the most remarkable thing in the world, but that's why I mentioned the space line days way back in the 60s. This is what you get. The site actually starts right on the turf. You can see the undulations of a very much eroded or flattened series of rigs. Again, you can see a bit more plainly there. And there again. What we found was that within the trench itself were a series of linear features, and Bruce can testify to this, he helped us. We struggled, we struggled to find something. But there was a, a pattern that there were marks to be seen. And frankly, this is just differential drive to do with the way the rigging product moved across the site. The other thing that we were learning to see at the time, which had corroborated by Derek Hall, is that the pottery out of this trench was significantly earlier than that which was found within the inner mountain walls. So I suggest that the, the, the agricultural activity was all, let's say, of an early medieval date. Moving across to the other trench, which is way down here. It's up here now. <laughs> it's right over there now. Oh, no. <laughs> it's just too sensitive. There it is up there. The idea was that we were looking at the ravelin, which is the central triangular work, and you get a sense of how this thing sort of lines up. There it is there. There's that number 10 trench. Here's the ravelin or spur. Here is our trench here. And you'll notice a series of quite well delineated steps leading down to the river of Burn. The trench itself is again the same as in number 10. This time, the earthwork was just right there below the turf. A clay pan, if you like, clay or plant, I suppose is the expression, laid over a cleared 
natural horizon, <laughs> natural horizon, there it is. So the only thing of archaeological interest really was that the upper layer had been cut. So we knew we were in an artificial earth world, but there was no to go on, except again, there was the early pottery. So there's something lurking of an agricultural nature over which the look at extensive clay pad bodies at the pit in association now rather with the ravelin and in association with the terraces leading down to the rilla. This is a spur, this is the Edinburgh Castle spur. This is drawn in the 1670s, I think. Here it is again. Where is it? There it is. Firing away in 1573. And here it is again. On Gordon of Rotherme. So they are basically triangular works projecting out. The idea is that there's a sort of technical enfilade fire across an attacking force. Here's the site you know well now, I should think. Well, this was excavated. I don't know about the donation list, but it would be and David Cole well the excavated. Me and David Cole and our friend. So we dug that way back when. Uh, but you'll notice again that the central element of the English defence is indeed just another projection, this time added with the added benefit of two flankers. But essentially, it's just another triangular work projecting out beyond Plankier, or, or, or that one, across the neck of the country. So similar. So basically what I'm going to say here is that the use of three basic polygons characterized these early 16th century artillery works in stark contrast to what I think happened in 1651. And what you've got basically is a square, a circle, and a triangle. These things are relatively easily achieved on the ground through the basics of Pythagoras and the properties of, of, a, of a circle, which we all know about, just as the compass point. Five times this. And right, and, and right angle triangles can be laid out relatively easily. And of course, they, they occur in some abundance. This is how this is um, trig netting artifact here. Uh, courtesy of how it fill up. And this one's based on concentric rectilinear structures. Again, given the symmetry, which seems to be important, but also it's, it's of, it, it does say it's a repeated polygon. Here we have. An attempt to be forced by Edinburgh Castle, never completed, but again, this one unbelievably <laughs> involved an awful lot of triangles and sort of massive zigzags. So that was sort of triangulation gone mad. And here we have this one. This was Henry VIII's preferred polygon circle, giving you what looks a bit like a Tudor Rose, I suppose. That's part of the product. But this <coughs> is Deal Castle, and it's about 1530 or something like that. And finally, that one, that's um, Lincolnshire. No, Whitwood. What's it? You can write some long, Longford, Longford, Longford Castle, near Salisbury. And that one has all three. That's got circles, triangles, and square. <laughs> so basically, an appraisal, one way of perhaps considering the date vintage on the contemporaneity of any of the larger earthworks, which nobody's very sure about. I mean, you've got these very my view is that the outer work, the rattle and the spur, whatever you call it, is associated with a potential symmetrical line leading from the gatehouse towards the apex of the triangle. You know, to all intents and oh, to all intents and purposes, that is a straight line. For all folios it makes. And the baseline for this construction is the BC line. The reason it's constrained on this side is because of the fallen ground. So this can be checked, you can check so. Here we go. That's just another AP really to show this thing. This just shows a rather confusing attempt in the first edition of West Map, which was just way wrong, so comprehensively wrong. The, um, the triangular work is over here somewhere. So it's just way off the beam. <laughs> Must have had a bad day. But by the time the second edition came along, it's much more accurate. And actually is a very good image of the site in the 19th century. And here we have, for the first time, the recognition of the entrenchment, as it's known, and this feature here, which I think are part of the siege works associated with the Edinburgh Mountain. That's the view of the gun platform, I think, which is an altogether more serious attempt to besiege and to take this castle. I'm glad to make the point that these rather enigmatic and ambitious symmetrical designs, if you like, are almost part of this, of a design landscape around the site, 
with artillery had their eyes bullets. Whereas this is a much more serious and perfunctory exercise. That just gives you a sense of the, of the scale of these features here and the suggestion, as I say, the culture, particularly at the time, the work itself may well or a little bit to the work of the film. I think that's almost inevitable. <coughs> so, to conclude, I think we're at the end now. Um, there we have it. It's running out towards the point. The site is very much a work in progress. The geophysics have indicated an uh, approach like this across all three elements of the site. If we take an overview on the, on the characteristics of the Asuru work, again, we can see something across the site without frankly the recourse to considerable expense and effort in terms of excavation. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much.